Canadian Football Perspective is proudly presented by our good friends over at Fox 40, introducing the new generation of electronic whistles brought to you by Fox 40. The new rechargeable Fox 40 electronic whistle produces 120 decibels of software-defined sound power with the push of a single button. You can pre-order yours today at fox40shop.com. That's fox40shop.com. And don't forget, they've given you a great offer here through Canadian Football Perspective. You can take 15% off your entire order with the code CFP15. Again, fox40shop.com. Use the promo code CFP15. Welcome, everybody, to The Breakdown. It is DT on OB on the other side. I am Marshall Perkins and at TSN underscore Marshall. We are thrilled to be back with you. DT, I'm glad to see you feeling a little bit better. I know uh, you came back from oh. the old, old Vegas round trip, got your ass kicked a little bit by the sicknesses, and uh, how are you feeling? Uh, good. COVID sucks. COVID yeah. sucks, but if you want to lose 13 pounds, I know a way. Whoa. Oh, man. I, no eating? I just, no, just, I have no appetite. Like, even oh. today, this is... A couple weeks after it still really started kicking my butt, I still have no appetite at all. And uh, c- certain flavors are much stronger than before. Uh, oh. Salty, I can't handle. Like even the littlest bit of salt is magnified 10 times the second it hits my tongue. It's it's disgusting, actually. Uh, and the people who have been uh, vaccine deniers for an extended period of time, I'm sure, are right now going, see, uh, it's a good thing. It'll help. It's actually a diet. It's a regimen. You, av- <laughs> you, 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 you can avoid salt and uh, you, you're, you drop 13 pounds. It's basically like going to good life. It's like, damn it, I gave them ammunition. Shoot. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, we wanted get to get your vaccines, everybody. Golly, yes, get I the vaccines. Imagine. Get the vaccines. Oh, um, I wanted to kick off the start here with something that I really enjoyed lately from the, uh, the Levitard show uh, where they have Ken tremendous is where he is at on social media. It is Mike, Mike Schur, who's the creator of the good place and uh, a writer on the office and parks and recreation and all that kind of stuff. And they love talking about nineties baseball on that show. So they'll just mm. go, go through and read names. You know, it's just like, they'll be like, Nomar Garcia para. And just they go, everybody in the room will go, ah, like just brings back memories, n- names that make you happy. Uh, they recently did a bit on that show where it was like the calm app. If people are familiar with that, where it plays, you know, soft running water, like a stream going. And then they had Mike sure this, <laughs> he was a diehard baseball fan come in and just read endless amounts of nineties baseball names to just make everybody happy in the room nice. over the top of the running water. I would like to do uh, a quick in memoriam, if you would, a shout out, a closing of the chapter of, the names of CFL All Stars, who are actually not CFL All Stars. Okay? Oh. Shall shall we remember these names forever in our memory as the people who we were somewhat confused uh, why many of them were All Stars, <laughs> uh, but these are the names for you to remember: Andrew Harris, Lucky Whitehead, Keen Schaefer Baker. Peter Godbear? Sean McEwen's in the division. What the hell were we doing there? Fans, I don't know what that is. Darius Bladek. Suk Chow. Philip Blake. Jamarcus Hardrick. That guy got hosed. 
I was going to say. <laughs> what he was on? really good. He was good this year. He's the best right tackle in the league, and he got hosed. Yeah, not great. Jagarid Davis. Got squeezed, eh? Yeah. Here got uh, Julian Hauser snuck in there, stole the uh stole the East from him, I thought, on that one. But Dylan Wynn? <laughs> Hamilton must have showed up in that fan vote because Dylan Oh Wynn. man. <laughs> not that he's not a good player, but I think uh, we'll talk about it in a second. Chris Edwards? He's been in corner for a chunk of the season. <laughs> he was voted in as the Sam linebacker. Donald Rutledge. On the practice roster for the last two games, Donald Rutledge, yeah. Uh, Winston Rose, who had his trials and tribulations against the Ottawa Red Blacks throughout the year at the start of the season. That's that's one we have to dive in on. Okay. Siante Evans. Deshaun Amos. Najee Murray. Preston Deku, who I have a funny note on this. Boris Beattie, who I used to call you Boris Bidet, but then people got scared of toilet humor. <laughs> And Daniel Adepaboye. There you go. Those are the guys that uh, were All-Stars that are no, long, no longer All-Stars. So I just want to mention here, uh, my funny trust in Deku uh, mm. reference, reference on this is that I sent out that list, okay, today uh, on Twitter because I, I just felt the need for people to be aware of here's the complete list of guys who were and now are not. Tristan Deku quoted that tweet when he saw it and said, we are the people's voice. Y'all asked the fans to vote, and they did. Thank you, fans. We love you and appreciate y'all. And I was like, that's the same Tristan Deku who was spraying Hamilton fans in the crowd with water bottles at the Labor Day Classic last year, right? <laughs> like, I was like, I love just the idea of like short-term memory loss and being like, we are the people's voice. The people voted for me because I am a man of the people. And I'm like, I, yeah. have, I have video of you last year spraying fans in the crowd with water bottles <laughs> yeah can it can, can we just put one overriding message out to start this because we're, we're going to go to some places that that are yeah guys are, are all stars anybody like a guy like donald rutledge uh the bombers sam linebacker for the first 16 games who gets voted an all-star and then all of a sudden is not an all-star did not deserve to be dicked around like that at no, all 100%, none of these yeah. guys deserved what they got like it was it it was odd, and we went really. That's that's a really strange pick. None of these guys deserve that, and any any mockery that comes from it, it th- is not deserved at all. Because this is a horrible, horrible mistake, and to put these what is it is it nineteen guys through it is, uh, is terrible. Yeah, I I totally agree. I I poke fun at it for the simple sake that uh, it's quirky as all hell, and it's something that I've never seen before. Like, I have never seen a league announce something that is carefully, you would think, carefully curated, looked over all the rest, and come out that way. So I'm with you. Like, the guys that are out there, you know, I (laughs) part jokingly, part seriously, I mention your names because I do want you to get your keep because the the reality is a lot of those guys could have been all-stars, and maybe some of them should have been. Like, you talk about with Jamarcus Hardrick, and we'll get into it. Shaver Baker? Yeah, Shaver Baker Shaver Baker wasn't, wasn't, yeah. He wasn't out of. It wasn't crazy that Schaefer Baker and Whitehead were all stars, right? Those yeah. guys were, maybe, maybe they're six and seven, but they were in the running on my ballot for sure. Yeah, and that's why I think the reaction was so interesting to all of this. The first thing that jumped out to me. So two things. One is I have a fun story for you because I was at Ticats practice yesterday with CFL.ca doing my playoff coverage for them, as I will be for out, throughout the next three weeks. And I'm sitting in the media room. It's just me and Louis B. And in comes Micah Johnson. And he was not on the original announcement as an all-star. Comes right. in and says, do you vote? I go, yeah, and I voted for you. He goes, and what do you what do you base your vote off of? And I said, well, obviously statistics play an important role in all of this, but I also feel comfortable that I know who the players in this league are that are special. Plus, I watch enough film to validate when I see guys making plays all the time. Where, I'm, like, For example, Calgary's defensive line right now. It's like, yeah, Sean Lemon, very good. There's an argument to be made that Floron Arimilade is right there in terms of difference maker on that line with Sean Lemon and that Derek w- Derek Wigan on the inside is making a ton of plays that are opening up ends alongside Mike Rose. It's like, you only know that if you're watching stuff, which it's very obvious based on a lot of the fan voting stuff that there's a lot of people who voted that are fans, no slight to the fans, but who just don't understand necessarily the interconnectedness of certain positions and how guys are affecting plays. So my answer to him was stats, I know who the players are that I need to watch for the most part because I watch enough film to understand who's making plays out there. And he let loose on me. Like he he was like, 
media say they watch film. Every media guy says they watch film. You guys don't know what you're watching. You're messing with people's legacies. You're messing with money. You're messing. And I was like, man, I voted for you. I voted you and Sean Oakman. Like you were the ones to me. And they ended up being him and Sean Oakman once things were tabulated correctly. But sure. he was really, really bothered. And like, <laughs> he kind of stormed out of the room and Brandon Revenberg was in there doing an interview with Louis B. And I said, yeah, that's, that's a guy who just lost a contract bonus. And Rev looked at me and goes, yeah, probably. He's like, <laughs> he's like that's kind of how it is, right? And it was it was a very real frustration for a lot of guys around the league and for us as media members because we don't want to have to take flack like that because we want to be validated in the fact that we do know who the good guys are. Because if you watch enough of the film like we do and you look and care enough about the league, you're going to end up picking the players that, for the most part, should be picked. Which is my second point here that I found really interesting yesterday, and I wish I would have tweeted this out just for posterity's sake. I saw you saying, mm, that's wrong, and this is wrong, and I don't know what's happening with that one. And and I was thinking back to my ballot as I'm reading some of your tweets, and I'm going, yeah, I, I'm 100% on board with DT. And then I see Danny Austin tweeting, I voted for this guy, this guy, this guy. I'm going, I did too. And I see yeah. like Je- Jeff Hamilton, and he's like, well, I, I would have voted for this guy. He's like, yeah, that's the same as DT and Danny and me. And so I'm going through and I'm almost seeing not consensus, but there were a lot of people that are media voters who were on social media saying, we all voted for the same guy. What's wrong here? And I wish I would have just been like, if we all voted for the same people, why the hell are our people that we voted for not the ones getting the all-star nuts? <laughs> and then we came to find out, obviously, oh, it's the weight and it's the... They just tabulated yeah. it incorrectly. But that that was very telling to me that we almost all came to our own defense because people were like, oh, that's stupid. How bad is the media doing this? You guys don't care about the game. It's like, no, we do. And I think we all pretty much voted for the same people. And they're not the people that are on these final ballots. Yeah, I, I'm happy to, to have debates with with players about should they have been an all star or not. Like I I get a few of them on Twitter because there are spots where. There are legit spots where it was tough to pick. Like if you, uh, I'm a voter in the West now. Yeah. If you had to vote for tackles in the West, you go Stanley Bright, Jamarcus Hardrick, Derek Dennis, and Joel Figueroa in BC is going to get overlooked this year. That guy was really good. Yeah. You have four guys for two spots. And if you believe you should go left, right, as I do, you have three guys for one spot. Now, now tell me, and n- none of us are going to get it perfect, especially, you know, well, nobody, literally nobody will get it perfect. But who had a better season? Derek Dennis, Joel Figueroa, or Stanley Bryant? And then think of everything that's involved in answering that question. Mm-hmm. Well, what about sacks? What about uh, pressures? Well, stats don't matter until they matter to me. Well, but okay, well, now we're on a whole thing there. Yeah. What are you asked to do? Who are you doing it with? How successful were you at it? What are our, what are our measures of success? I kind of don't care about the run game until it gets to kind of a tiebreaker situation because we're a 67 to 70% passing lead, right? So I care about how you do in the pass game and I care about the mistakes you make in the pass. We all have our way to go about it, but to, there are times where I won't take, you know, getting crabs for, well, you picked the wrong linebackers. There are five linebackers in the West and you had to, you could only pick two of Thurman, Judge, Big Hill, Sankey, and people have forgotten Larry Dean had a really good year yep. coming off of the killings. So, uh, and, and, and Dean is not a guy who's going off on Twitter about being eliminated, but Dean is overlooked as much as anybody else because that guy was second in the league in tackles. It is really hard in spots. It's really easy in some spots, but it is really hard in some spots. And I have no problem defending, hey, well, why did you pick Adam Big Hill and Jameer Thurman when it was Adam Big Hill and Cam Judge? I'm like, oh, other people like Cam Judge. I like Jameer Thurman because A, B, and C. It's yeah. just don't pretend. I'm sure there are some of us among the media who who don't – I'm going to say don't have the time to, to do it 100% the way they would like to because they have other responsibilities. Being a newspaper writer in this era, forget it. Yes. That you can commit hours That's... to do it. I Bless your heart. If, you could, if you're a newspaper writer who did commit hours to his all-star ballot or her all-star, all-star ballot. Uh, that's a really important point to make here that I was talking to somebody this morning about this exact thing. They said, you know, how how do we fix this? How does this get better? Because it seems like every year, the, whether it's the fan voting getting mistabulated or just in general, like the all-star vote, the voting process. And the reality is, and this is this is a much, much larger issue that speaks to media and not just in Canada, but let's talk Canadian media. Everybody is being squeezed. 
everywhere jobs are being axed. Everyone is being asked to do more. Like your wife works in media. You know how this is. It doesn't matter if it's print or radio or television or you're being asked to be your own cameraman or camera woman. You're being asked to be, you know, drive, drive yourself into the middle of nowhere, do a stand up, put your own microphone on. Everybody in TV, for the most part, does their own makeup if they get makeup at this point. Like, I remember going to TSM for the draft. They had a makeup person just sitting there, and I was like, the hell is this? <laughs> like, yep. Where I, they actually pay somebody to just, like, come in. They're like, yeah, it's like an eight-hour shift, and they're just here if you need them. I'm like, haven't seen that in uh, any time I've been doing television type stuff. So I remember going into CHCH in Hamilton when Ken Welch was still the sports reporter, and I was kind of like, following him around for the days he invited me to just kind of like see how tv works whatever i was still in university and kenny's a good friend of mine and and i remember you know he's running around he's cutting tape and he's writing a script he's putting in the prompter and and they come he goes come with me runs into the bathroom and there's just like a all this makeup spread across the desk he just starts grabbing random things and smacking his face and then runs out and goes on camera 30 seconds later and it's like that's the norm like all of these jobs are being asked to do ridiculous things so I'm incredibly thankful that my situation and your situation, although we grind and it takes a long time, but we are able to give what we hope is the best possible honest analysis that comes from the work of actually watching and tracking and understanding these things. But I am never going to criticize somebody who writes for a living or has to cover three different beats or, yep. uh, you know, has to cover two different markets or whatever it might be, because we're, everybody's being asked to do ridiculous things because we're just not investing in media coverage in these things anymore. And the vote is inevitably going to get hurt by that because you're going to have people who are less able to sit down and rewatch every game of the CFL throughout the entirety of the season. So by the time the ballot comes out, like you say, there's spots where you get squeezed where it's really tough. There's some that are easy. But the reason that some of those are easy is because we've had the last 24 weeks to understand who's making plays. And like, for example, the, even the major awards, like when it comes to uh, the, the rookie uh, vote going on, it's like you and I have said Dalton Schoen has been the guy all year long. We've known that since week four or week five. And we've just seen him continue to get more and more and more excellent. And that's why I look at this and just think like, we have the benefit of having those things. There's a lot of people who, who just don't have the time or are unable to invest in that same way. So yeah, th that's an important point to make on the landscape of Canadian media being part of the conversation when it comes to all-star voting in the Canadian Football League, which doesn't have a large dedicated media base. You see it, I'm sure, at the Grey Cup, in the <laughs> it's the same people every year, right? And it's, and it's a, a relatively small group compared to a lot of other sports. Yeah, uh, different and different guys have different ways of going about it, right? You and I track a ton of stuff. You'll end up talking to more coaches than I will because I I don't really like talking to people. <laughs> I, I, yep. I'm not the most talking to people guy. People I try talk to talk to people. coaches. I usually yeah, yeah. ask I ask coaches questions and then they're like, "Shut up, idiot." Yeah, but then <laughs> uh, other guys will talk a lot to coaches and go, "Well, what do you think? What about this?" And then from that, they'll form their own opinion as reporters. We all have our kind of own way to get about it. But then eventually, we get to a spot where. When I look at the, like, uh, I only got to vote in the West. So when I look at the West All-Stars, I go, yeah, there's only four names I would have minor quibbles with. And I go, okay, this is actually a really good list of All-Stars for the West in 2022, ultimately, when they got the recount done. Because, yeah, I, I have, you know, two guys that I go, I don't understand why you're on there. But two guys like, yeah, you were probably the third guy on my list, honestly. So it, we ended up with a in a really good place. And I think honoring the guys that deserve to be honored, including a couple that I thought would be, I didn't think everybody was going to acknowledge a guy like Kenny Lawler for the season that he had because injuries in Edmonton stunk. Yeah, no doubt. What was your, uh, your Winston Rose snippet that you wanted to get in? Oh, so Winston Rose showed up as a number one cornerback on the West all-star ballot. And, and anybody, any bomber fan saw that and went, no, I no, it just can't be Winston's good dude. But the double moves just absolutely punished him this year from game one with Jalen Acklin all the way through the season. Uh, I don't have a defensive back in my database that has more yards allowed in coverage than Winston Rose this season. So when I saw that, I saw him as an all-star, I went, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I, what were other people looking at? And as it turns out, that was one of the mistakes that was ultimately corrected. And uh, it ends up becoming Jonathan Moxie of the Stampeders, which I thought he was on my ballot. So Moxie and Peters, but yeah, uh, 
Donald Rutledge was a guy who the Bombers went and traded for Alden Darby and moved Rutledge to the practice roster. So he was available to any team. And you go, yeah, the, there were problems with cycling. What, you'll, what will happen sometimes is people go, how's that guy an all-star? Well, if you look at the West this year, I think there's only two guys that were full-time Sam linebackers this year, dimebacks. Mm -hmm. One was Rutledge and one was Moncrief in Saskatchewan. Edmonton rotated guys through, eventually settled on McConzo. Uh, BC had two guys. Eventually, Ragamba ends up there. And Calgary had injuries. And, and probably, I have to guess, three four guys played dime for them this year. Picking an all-star from there can be pretty tough. And can you, you can end up with guys who aren't all-stars, but they're the only guy who played that position for 16 games. That's, that's where some of these can get tough when you're picking from four and five teams is injuries can really punish you there. So I, I thought Rutledge I, – I was surprised at Rutledge, but I went, maybe that's an injury thing and people are punishing Moncrief for playing on a six-win team. Yeah, my, uh, my kind of interesting example of that I think would be the East Division running back spot because – oh. Man, it's, it's like what the hell yeah. do you what the hell do you choose? Because Jezrin Antwi is still the leading rusher for the Montreal Alouettes. William Stanback didn't play nearly enough and certainly wasn't effective in the in getting back into the rhythm of things. And so he's getting up to speed. Walter Fletcher's nice, but he's not a standout. You go to Hamilton, it's a split between Sean Thomas Erlington, Wes Hill's got a chunk of time, and then Don Jackson has been up and down throughout the lineup throughout the year. Toronto, Andrew Harris. I think might still be the leading carry getter for the Argonauts on the season. I think he was when I was prepping for that week 21 game against Montreal, but AJ Olette ends up getting the nod because he's on the team that won the East and he's contributed in a variety of ways, whether it's pass blocking, catching it out of the backfield, running through guys a couple times, I guess. And in Ottawa, it was supposed to be William Standback, but it's Devontae Williams. It was a Galander. Well, start. Yeah. Yeah. And, but yeah. And it's just, uh, sorry. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's just like there was nobody really to pick in that spot. And that was one of those weird ones where you're like, I guess, Olet, uh, if you wanted to, to pick based on some of those things. But I think the one thing that did legitimately bother me about this process as we kind of bounce around it is that Braden Statchel, who runs the CFL Reddit account, you know, he posted this little rant this morning that I saw as we're recording on Thursday. It just said, like, you know, we, we always try to protect the league and we defend the league and things come out that are wrong and all the rest. And, you know, we say, ah, it's okay. You know, get them next time, guys, and all that stuff. The real problem that he had with this and the real problem that I have with it in total agreement is that there's a lot of good people that work inside the CFL office. A lot of good people. Like whether it is at the football operations level, if it's communications, PR, uh, you know, it's – I think that there's a lot of quality, quality people there. I just don't understand how anybody in that building could look at that list before publication and say, yes. And for me, just basic human, I don't even want to say psychoanalysis, but like there's two options when you look at that list, if you think there's some stuff that's kind of off. One is that you have to go, oh, and you know this DT, because when you're tracking games and a number spits out that you don't like, or a number spits out that seems totally off the wall, you have two options. One is weird, crazy. Yeah, it must be right. And the other is to go, I need to run that data again because I don't think that's right. And yeah. when you have the Calgary Stampeders with no offensive linemen selected in the West All-Star, that's the biggest one for me where a red flag should have gone up. And, and again, there's two options. Wow, crazy. Man, I guess... Calgary just did, didn't get very many votes or something is wrong here. Maybe we shouldn't send this out until we figure out if this is actually correct or not. And I don't know if they were working on deadline with that and they got pushed up against it or, but you're the league. You make your own deadlines as we've seen with the Ooh. halftime show, <laughs> you make your own deadlines on these things. And it, it's just concerning for me that two things must've happened here. One or the other. Somebody saw it and shrugged, or somebody saw it and just didn't realize how off it was. And to me, that's legitimately concerning to have that at, at the top of the league office where you got to know your league. You got to know your players. I understand there's a lot of people that work in marketing and maybe events and all these different things that you don't have to know the average yards per carry of the Calgary Stampeders on the year is six and that they're leading the CFL. You don't have to be in the nitty gritty stuff, but you should probably know who's good at what. Or who your stars are, who the people you are that you're trying to push to the forefront in order to make the league exciting and have name brand notoriety. And like we say, there were some lucky whitehead, 
Dylan Wynn, like to me, those are guys who are Keen Shaver Baker beloved in their market. You can literally look at some of the names that were selected who were not actually taken in the end ballot, uh, the end, end results, I should say, and it looks like a fan ballot. Like, it looks like, oh, I love that guy. I identify him as part of my team. Somebody should have gone. There's a lot of names on here that are, I, there might be some missing pieces, and I think a lot of the names that we see are people that are really fan favorites. Maybe the fan vote was tabulated incorrectly. I don't know. Let's go check it. Why, why that didn't happen hurt a lot of people, I think, legitimately. Yeah. My, my wife, when I mentioned it to my wife, I said, oh, this thing happened at the CFL. She, her immediate reaction was, oh, it sounds like one person was tasked to do too many things. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's actually a really good way to look at it. Of, you know, for the same reason that we go, that I say, if you can't spend five hours on your, on your ballot, I get it because your job is very tough in the media. Entirely possible. A third possibility is the person in charge of it is asked to do too many things. Like, oh, my God, we got to do this and this and this and this. And it just, it's one of those things. Uh, and the CFL needs to kind of go back and look at exactly what led to this, because this is, like you said, can you ever remember this being a thing in any other league ever, ever? This is, this is one of your, this is one of your days, right? Where you go, we get to honor the greatest players in our league. This is going to be awesome. Holy cow. We had to pull the article down two hours later. And then nine hours later after that, make a correction, whatever the the time yeah, was. Yeah. Yeah, it's it needs to be. This is not a great year for the CFL. And again, like you said, we are. It's Thursday, and the Great Cup is two Sundays plus three <laughs> days from now. And we don't know that it's the. I don't even know who the. There's one band that has a show in Saskatoon and then Edmonton with a day on the <laughs> Sunday and whatever that is. And who, who is it? Announced, who is it? What I I'd have to. I don't know my music. It's I don't know the. Smooth runners. I don't know. Is that a band? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I also saw the kickoff mortifying. show. I, I saw the kickoff show was a band called Valley, and I looked up some of their stuff, and I was like, okay, I don't know. I guess <laughs> it's like, Got from Saskatchewan. So, That's good. I, I guess, but it, for me, it was. Uh, and again, I tweeted this out a long time ago, and now it's you know completely irrelevant because it's obvious it's not going to be them. But when it got announced that. Saskatchewan was hosting the Grey Cup. I was like, "You gotta have the Sheepdogs do the halftime show." Like that—that that to me was, and I understand that the Sheepdogs are not the universal. Everyone's gonna absolutely love them, but as soon this was years ago, and all I could think about was in 2013 when it was in Regina, they played the kickoff, and it was more badass than most of the halftime shows that I've seen. In my opinion, I love the Sheepdogs, so I'm biased. But yeah. they they absolutely tore the roof off that place in 2013 as part of the kickoff show. And I watched them. Same thing I did with the beaches. Because when the beaches were in Edmonton, I think it was, in 2018, uh, I saw them play. I was listening to them play the uh, the warm-up uh, sound check about six hours before kickoff. And I was like, they are going to be a halftime show. Like, at some point, they are absolutely going to do halftime. I feel like that's the path you're supposed to take. That was nine years ago that the Sheepdogs did the opener. I looked at the Sheepdogs concert stuff, and they're like Minnesota and whatever. And I, I actually tweeted at them and said, like, the Sheepdogs should be getting this this year. I don't know what's possible on their schedule. And they tweeted back and said, ah, it's just a quick flight. Like, we, we'd be happy to just kind of like, you know, rip over there, do it, rip back, do our <laughs> show kind of thing. So they, I don't know if their social media was being sarcastic or not, but like at the Sheepdog said, yeah, we'd be in. And I thought, man, if the league wanted that, that'd be a home run if it lined up with, you know, the rights and the recording label that they're negotiating with or whatever. Uh, man, I, I'm not a music expert either, DT. I just, I, I know that some homegrown boys out there that play some kick-ass rock music probably would have been a pretty sweet deal based on what I saw in 2013. Oh, okay. This does, this makes less sense now. Uh, the Offspring is the band I was thinking of, and I don't really know them from a hole in the ground. They play in Saskatoon on the 19th, and they play in Edmonton on the 21st. So people go, there's a hole on the 20th, but as I look at it, they are a punk rock band from California, <laughs> USA. So that's not really, I don't know that that's really great cup. So maybe I'm not on the, uh, not on tour with yeah, that, that Hey, uh, can we, can we talk about something that makes absolutely no sense among the voters? We need to chastise the voters for one thing. Sure, yes. Uh, Janarian Grant is the all-star uh, special yeah. teamer in the West. Janarian Grant, very deserving of that honor. Three return touchdowns, a couple of them in really big spots. He put the knife into Montreal 
and he started off the first game against BC with a kickoff yes. return for a touchdown, and then his last kick return touchdown, <laughs> pardon me, I'll keep that game alive, very deserving. However, he's not the most outstanding special teams nominee in the West. Mario Alford of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders is. How Mario Alford is the most outstanding special teams nominee for the West, but not the all-star special teams player in the West, makes no sense at all, yeah. right? Like, I do my, I did my ballot. Here's my big awards. Well, uh, if I have Lemon as the most outstanding defensive player, he's the number one defensive end. If Alford is the, has to be the special teams player because he's the most outstanding. That one, I don't understand how voters got there. Yes. Yeah, I'm with you. And, and for me, it harkens back to the article I wrote on CFL.ca that was essentially saying, hey, whoever you're voting for as the West Division all-star quarterback, that's your MOP vote, like basically. And I know he didn't end up getting there because they ended up you know, changing things up with, with BC and what they were kind of presenting moving forward. But I just kept thinking, we're all going to have this Rourke Kalaros discussion, which was a very short-lived, very brief discussion, it felt like, on the national media scene. It was like, Rourke's back. We're all excited. He had an incredible first part of the year. If he would have stayed that way, it would have been crazy. But Zach was so good in the second half that nothing Rourke did in the first half mattered. Anyways, we're done with this conversation. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah, I guess that's the simplest way to put it. But I was basically just saying, like, whoever you believe in is the most outstanding player uh, in the West, regardless of whether it's Winnipeg or BC, a quarterback, I'm like, that has to be your all-star quarterback. And it's to a different level when you're talking special teams. But yeah, that is, that's not an accounting error. That's just a straight up people change their minds or I don't know what that is. Maybe somebody forgot who they decided to put in as Alford being that guy for Saskatchewan. And then they end up going with Winnipeg on their vote. It's, uh, but it's a strange strange between the two and we do get that once in a while like sometimes that's yeah outstanding lineman stuff will pop up like that uh where a guy you know is an all-star but doesn't get nominated or is nominated and isn't an all-star so uh yeah a little bit a little bit strange i'm with you on that Let, and you mentioned you mentioned uh Kalaris and uh and nathan rourke and there's there's kind of a sentiment that still kind of exists that well it rourke was great and Kalaris was fine this year can we, we need to get off the Kolaris was fine this year. Second half Kolaris is was, what did it. He huh? Second half is what did it. Because in the first half of the year, oh. I was kind I was kind of like, yeah, I mean, Zach is still Zach. He's still very good, but there's some games that here and there. Outside of the game where Dane outshot him and went for five touchdowns and Winnipeg lost to Hamilton. Outside of that, like Zach was crazy in the second half of the season. He he dominated BC in that first meeting when in the first part of the season, but uh he he finished the season. Kolaris finished the season. Uh, his touchdown percentage. He threw a touchdown on eight and a half percent of his his passes. Uh, Nathan Rourke was seven point seven percent of his passes. So, as many uh, you know, he's not throwing as many balls as Rourke was, yeah. but he's throwing more for touchdowns. Uh, the highest number I have since twenty fifteen of touchdown percentage in a full season over two hundred passes is seven percent. So he beat that by. You know, twenty percent. He was a point and a half above the highest number of uh, touchdown percentage in the last seven years in the CFL, and that was Kolaris and Hamilton in twenty fifteen. Yeah, Zach was unbelievable this year. Unbelievable, out of the pocket, under pressure, touchdown shown. Out of the pocket, touchdown Dembski. I need to scramble to keep this alive. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Oh, I took a whack in the head, and now Drew Brown has come in. Okay, fine, but I got us the first down. I, I, I just. In the beginning, it was maybe more justified because Rourke was awesome. But if Rourke goes his full season and throws 50 touchdowns, whatever, it still doesn't mean that – I think – I don't know if I used it on our, on our podcast before, but, you know, uh, Jesse Owens broke the world record of the 1936 uh, 100-meter dash. The guy who finished second also broke the world record. So, but he's, so he's not a big pile <laughs> well, of poo, and, right? And that like, was emblematic of the whole season, though. Like, that was the quarterback yeah. play in the CFL this year was Rourke and Kalaros, everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, and and by by the time we get to the finish line, to me it wasn't Rourke and then Kalaros and then everybody else way down here. It was it was Rourke and Kalaros and Kalaros is every Kalaros fans every reason to believe he was just as good as Nathan Rourke was this season because beat him in touchdown percentage. Uh, and uh, by the way, didn't turn the ball over a ton either. And oh by the way, uh, he helped his team to fifteen wins. So there, if there's any set, if I get even the hint of sentiment that 
oh, he's not a worthy MOP. I'm going to start punching. I'm going to start punching, Marshall. <laughs> um, I want to get from you in about 30 seconds or less, so we have a second on the back end here. Uh, who wins the Western semifinal and why? Uh, Calgary, because I don't know the condition of Nathan Rourke, and I'm sure he's not. I'm sure he's not 100. Uh, he, percent He's incredible if he just stands in the pocket. If he just stood there, Drew Bledsoe like as a statue, he'd probably be amazing. But it's that other stuff that makes it special and made that 41-40 game possible. Uh, Calgary is ready to go on every level of that team, so I think the Calgary Stampeders win that game. Really underrated thing for me in that one is that the Calgary Stampeders were all talking about, you know, their running attack, which means something, obviously, getting the all-star nods that they deserve on that group. They got great linebackers, but, like, the reality is Rourke hasn't really had to move off the spot yet, and that defensive line, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. that's, that's to me, the story of the game is, does that offensive line for BC hold up against that defensive line, and can Rourke do what he needs to do to get through his reads? Or is he just going to be getting hit and chucking and getting hit and chucking and this isn't going to look like it was in the first half of the season? Yeah, the guy who who was the nominee for most outstanding defensive player, you could argue is the third best player on that defensive line. That's right. how good they are. And they rush three and four and they get there with three and four. Uh, I will just round this out by saying as much as I think Calgary is is absolutely on board with what you're saying like they're ready to take it everything to the to the max and just their team overall as a whole is like terrifying man i really want Rourke versus Kalaros. we were just talking yep. about like those two oh, yeah. being side by side i think calgary might have the better group overall but i'm gonna feel cheated if we end 2022 and we don't see those orange uniforms have to go into ig field and try and answer the bell against the champs uh, i want it so bad i can taste it like salt which is really uh, <laughs> no honestly i want that game so bad i'm i'm honestly rooting for bc there's a lot of guys on that calgary team i love but bc with nathan Rourke coming into winnipeg that it's the game i mean it's it's a game we all deserve let's say that yeah no doubt no doubt uh the eastern semifinal. any leans for you montreal i think just rolls i think yeah. montreal hammers I, they, they can bring enough pressure and, and get after dane evans enough uh, interested to see what what Winnipeg, uh, probably what Hamilton decides to do with the run game because it's different. They do it differently and they use it differently when West Hills is in there and he's he's hitting some people. So yeah, I just think Montreal Montreal has enough uh, at quarterback at running back and that defense can can attack. I think Montreal. I was leaning in Hamilton earlier in the week. Then I put together the st the stats board on my play by play prep like I usually do, and I went, man, there's a lot of things that would have to go right for Hamilton here in order to put to pull this off, and knowing how crazy that environment's going to be. So I I'm with you on that one. I think now that I've actually dug into it, Montreal looks like they're going to be a very formidable challenge. DT has another bye week because his team is so damn good out there in Winnipeg. But you can follow him on social at DT on OB. Uh, I will be with you on CFL.ca playoff coverage. I will be in Montreal as of Saturday morning there Thanks. until uh, after the game on Sunday doing post-game recaps. And I will also have a Twitter space on the at CFL handle for you coming up on Sunday night at the end of the Western semifinal for now. Thanks so much for hanging out with us here on the breakdown as always follow along at CF perspective. And we will talk to you on the breakdown right here next week.